Hello and welcome to Cambridge Geopolitics Conversations and to this podcast series on resistance, radicalisation and religion, where we'll be looking at division and extremism in different parts of the world, in different contexts and times. I'm Suzanne Rain and I'm joined today by Timothy Garton Ash, Professor of European Studies at Oxford University. Timothy is an historian and most importantly for us, an eyewitness. He has written some of the most widely read books about Eastern Europe, both during the Cold War and after the Iron Curtain fell, and his journalism and commentary continue to offer vivid insights to political and social dynamics there. A new edition of his book, The Magic Lantern, which is an eyewitness account of the 1989 revolutions, has just been reissued by Atlantic Books with an extra chapter covering the last 30 years. We're going to have a very broad and sweeping conversation, which will, in the time allowed, only scratch the surface, but which I hope will nonetheless enable us to pull out some of the key themes. Welcome to you, Timothy. Pleasure to be with you. Let's start straight after World War II. Underground resistance had, of course, been a a critical element of the Second World War, and defiant underground movements, which opposed communist rule in Eastern Europe, began as soon, basically, as it fell under Soviet influence. Is it possible to pull out some of the common characteristics of the underground resistance to communism, which threaded through the uprisings of 1953, 1956, 1968 and 1980? So you're absolutely right to point out that there was resistance almost from before the beginning of communist rule, because communist rule, of course, begins while the Second World War is still going on. And initially, it is armed resistance by, for example, the non-communist Polish Home Army. And that actually continues a remarkably long time. I mean, amazingly, the last of the so-called Forest Brothers in Estonia, who who lived in in concealment in the forest, uh, only came out in the 1970s. But what I think has happened is that, so to speak, the hope of armed resistance rapidly fades through the late 1940s, but it's still there to some extent in the workers rising in East Germany in 1953, and of course in the Hungarian Revolution, where many people I knew fought with a gun in their hands as young men mainly in 1956, and actually some young women. But then what happens is Through 56 in Hungary, 68 in Czechoslovakia, the defeated workers' protests on the Baltic coast in Poland in 1970-71, to Solidarność, the birth of the Solidarity Movement in 1980, and actually on to 1989, you have a cumulative learning process. And each country learns from the other, each country learns from its own earlier mistakes, And they gradually, by trial and error, develop a model of peaceful opposition, which actually prepares the way for a negotiated revolution. What do you think was the effect of the repression of the resistance on how they developed during that time? So so did did the repression make their resolve stronger? Did it change the way that they organised themselves? In a sense, that's a very important part of the learning process I just talked about. It's not just we're not going to win by armed resistance. And by the way, the West is not going to come to our aid, because remember, in 1956, a lot of people misled by broadcasts on Radio Free Europe believed that the West, NATO, would would ride to their aid like the cavalry on a white horse. But it's also working out what you can do and what you can't do. So, for example, I vividly remember a moment in the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk in August 1980, when someone proposed we should say we must abolish censorship. And someone else immediately said, look what happened to the Prague Spring. It was when they abolished censorship, or said they would, that the Soviets decided to intervene. So I think it's that very subtle learning process, as well, of course, as a bitter memory of oppression. Was there any sense that repression made people give up? Or did it just make them find different ways to continue a resistance? Because, I mean, it was brutal. Yeah. At times. And and remember, the West absolutely accepted the division of Europe in the 1970s. That was the premise of detente. Uh, Many people felt they'd been abandoned. 
And when I started traveling behind the Iron Curtain, the assumption was that the Soviet bloc, the communist regimes, would be there for decades to come. And so people made their lives, married, had children, you know, got a job, made their careers. In that perspective, it's very important to remember that. Nobody knew the war was going to come down in 1989. So the opposition activity was not in the expectation that the walls would come crumbling down a few years later. So we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. I wanted to ask now about the role of the church, and in that case, both Catholic and Protestant in in different parts of Eastern Europe. You've said that had there been no Polish Pope, then there would have been no Solidarity Revolution in Poland in 1980, for example. And this crossover between the Catholic Church and Solidarność also created figures such as the martyred Polish priest Jerzy Popiawuszko. But also you had the Lutheran Church in Germany, especially in Leipzig from 1982 onwards, as, as an emboldening factor in the resistance. How much of a threat did religious belief play to the, to the communists? And how did this sort of second alternative identity undermine the structures that the communists were trying to build? So I think on the whole, people underrate and underestimate the role of religion in the changes in Eastern Europe, because it doesn't quite fit our contemporary secular worldview. And I think there were at least two distinct roles it played. One was, and I spent quite a lot of time wrestling with the question, what makes one person a resistance fighter and another person a collaborator, one person a Stauffenberg, the other person an Albert Speer, one person a dissident, the other an informer for the secret police. It's very hard to generalize about resistors, but quite a lot of them have a strong belief and value system. And of course, that's one thing that religion gives you, is a strong belief and value system. So up against highly ideological regimes, you had a different value system and a different anthropology, a different picture of the human being. And many of the people I encountered in Poland and East Germany, but also elsewhere, had thought very profoundly about how the image of the human being in communism was fundamentally wrong, namely far too optimistic. (laughs) Communism would work fine if everyone had been angels. Christians know better. They know that people can be higher than the angels or lower than the beasts. So that, that's, that's one part of it. The other part of it is more, so to speak, secular and social, which is, as you know, in their totalitarian phase, communist regimes try to eliminate every aspect of independent social life, everything that Edmund Burke talked about, all the little platoons. By the way, something that is happening again in communist China as we speak. And the churches were both literally and metaphorically free spaces, spaces of free association, physically places where people could meet, mentally places where people could meet and associate when they couldn't almost anywhere else. And many of the people who acted in these church groups were, how shall I put it, not 100% absolutely devout Christians, but it it offered this this opportunity. Most dramatically in Poland, of course, where the Polish Catholic Church was never broken by Stalinism, Uh, there was a 200-year-old tradition of identifying the independence of the nation, the soul of the nation with the Catholic Church. And I remember, for example, when a friend of mine in Krakow had tried to organize a lecture on Orwell's 1984. And this had been broken up. She went to her local cardinal, who was a man called Karol Wojtyła, later to be Pope John Paul II. And he said, fine, we'll, we'll do it in church. So they had the same lecture in a church. And the police, sure as hell, weren't going to break that one up. So I think those two functions. Let me just add, in how we think about the great change of 1989, yes, it was a great movement for freedom for Europe, towards the West. But both nationalism and the churches were also very strong drivers of the movement. 
that's in- incredibly interesting. And, and there are a lot of parallels in what you're saying with conversation I had last week with Ali Ansari about the Islamic revolution in Iran, which was also a resistance movement, actually. And that blend of nationalism, religious fervor, identity, it, it is very interesting to see the parallels. You you mentioned before the 1989 revolutions seem inevitable now, but of course were almost unimaginable even sort of halfway into the 1980s. And and I wanted to sort of come back to that sort of question about good and bad, so the right side, the wrong side, freedom versus repression. What was the mood as as you sort of felt it among people across Eastern Europe who you knew at the time? So were they were they hopeful? Were they cautious? Were they afraid? And I, I presume that some people were prepared to fight to make the change happen no matter what, while others feared losing what they had. I mean, it's these huge risks that people were taking with, with no guarantee that it was going to change. And, and we tend to simplify it as, you know, these people are on the right side, these people are on the wrong side. But what did those people who, who were fighting to try and stop the revolution of 1989, what did they think they were fighting for? And they, they weren't just bad people, were they? So I emphatically think there were people who were on the right side and people on the wrong side. And there were deeply admirable people like Václav Havel, who I was privileged to call a friend, who spent years in prison for their convictions. And there were deeply despicable people on the regime side, in the secret police, and so on. So let's not muddle this up too much. (laughs) Um, So I, I think that the real point is that, as you rightly said, almost nobody believed that a nuclear-armed communist empire, the Soviet empire, could softly and suddenly vanish away in the course of a year. And therefore, even the most optimistic of my friends, for example, among the Polish dissidents, Poland is a famously optimistic country, were imagining a long process of the gradual erosion of the Soviet empire and what I myself called the Ottomanization of the Soviet empire, i.e. you would gradually get more and more areas of freedom, not just in churches, but in wider society, in the media, in education, and so on. My friend Adam Michnik called it not socialism with a human face, but socialism with the teeth knocked out. And uh, But probably a process going into the 21st century. In a sense, a bigger obstacle to change apart from the Soviet Union, and without Gorbachev, none of this would have happened in 1989, was, so to speak, general scepticism, persuading a larger part of the population that change was actually possible, and it was worth taking risks to make the change. And that came very late in some places. Just to give you one illustration, in Poland, the clear turning point was the 4th of June, 1989, the first semi-free election since the communist takeover in the late 1940s, where Solidarity got every seat in the parliament and the newly created upper house of parliament, virtually every seat they could get, and they just swept the board, and the communists more or less gave up. A week later, I was in East Berlin talking to a group of dissident friends, and they were still in deepest gloom, saying, Oh, yeah, but it's possible in Poland, it could happen in Poland, it can happen in Hungary, but it couldn't possibly happen here. So actually, the the conviction that change is possible uh, only came in East Germany, really in October, early November. Sorry, I haven't answered your question about the people defending it. Um, the people defending it, look, look, honestly, for the most part, they were defending their own positions, their own privileges their own careers, their own life choices. It wasn't, I mean, there were certainly evil people there, but it wasn't so much that as the defence of an established order. Thank you. Now you've, um, and I remember actually myself, I had friends who were my age, so they were 19 in 1989 when, when the wall fell, and they described being in East Germany and not knowing the wall was going to fall and knowing that they could get out if they drove to Hungary but they didn't know how how many days it would be possible to get out and having to decide whether that night to take the risk and leave, knowing they might never see their family again. So it's a huge 
personal decisions and some went and some didn't go. And and that's what I want to, to ask a little bit about now is, is the period of the 1990s where you where you had the sort of reckoning however you however you look at it and you've written very personally about what it felt like to read your own Stasi files friendships and lives were shattered when people found out I mean trust broke down in in across different you know working communities and 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 families and I I was thinking that in simple terms the people who had the most lost the most although you could argue they didn't necessarily but but it's not necessarily that the people who had the least gained the most over time. So what, how would you describe the impact of that phase of, of everything being brought out into the open? So this is a problem which countries all over the world have grappled with, are grappling with, will grapple with. What do you do about the difficult past after the dictatorship is over? And there is no perfect solution. My Closest Polish friends, the former dissidents, believed that they should follow the Spanish example. If you remember, in the transition from the fascist dictatorship in the mid-1970s in Spain, the recipe was, in the words of Jorge Simprun, amnesty and amnesia. Just don't talk about the past at all. Just forget about it. Let bygones be bygones, because otherwise we'll have a repeat of the Civil War, which was their nightmare. And my Polish friends thought that's the way you do it. 30 years later, I think they're thinking rather differently because even in Spain, the past of the Civil War is now a huge subject of political controversy. So actually, it didn't work in Spain. And in Poland, the whole politics of the populist right, the Law and Justice Party, was built on the claim that the difficult past had not been confronted and therefore it wasn't really a proper revolution. And, you know, so you pay a heavy price for not confronting the past. Of course, you also pay a price for confronting the past. The great example is a woman called Vera Wollenberger, who was one of the few East German dissidents who discovered on reading the Stasi files that her husband had been informing on her to the Stasi for years and years and years. Just imagine that. I myself, you know, went back and read my Stasi file and talked to the people who informed on me and wrote a book about it called The File, A Personal History. And it's a disturbing experience, but but I wasn't a victim. But I have to say, if you ask most of my East German friends, tough though it was, would you rather not have had the chance? The answer is invariably, I wish to have the opportunity. I wish they had the opportunity to have that personal reckoning with the past. Some decide not to take it, but at least I've had the opportunity. And it does enable you to do something incredibly important for new democracies, which is to draw a clear line between past and future, because otherwise the past keeps coming back to haunt you. So this is something which I'd like us to explore in more depth, bringing it up to the present day. And as you say, you've, you've just looked back at the last 30 years in, in the reissue of The Magic Lantern. And we're both in the UK and in the US at the moment, we're struggling with the repercussions of essentially a divisive electoral campaign, whether it's a referendum, whether it's the sort of polarised politics in, in the US. And, and, and in Eastern Europe, you had the same thing when the wall came down. You had the people who had been working for the state and the people who hadn't, and suddenly things flip over. Are these events, I mean, this is, you know, we've got 30 years now to, to catch up, but, but are the effects of this division still playing out and and obviously the sort of immediate things that we think about are the popularity of the far right parties in east germany the, the sort of rise of ultra conservative and sometimes anti democratic politics in in poland and hungary but but how do, how do you see this kind of the working of, out of it all up to the present day so i think it's important to say that marine le pen or possibly Nigel Farage, would be quite at home on the Hungarian right or the Polish right. And that Viktor Orban and Jaroslav Kaczynski say themselves they like Trump's America. 
So it's a much broader global phenomenon, which in sort of the crudest summary is a kind of anti-liberal counter-revolution. It's a reaction against developments of liberalization, globalization, Europeanization, digitalization over the last 30 years. And then you go a level down and say, what are the particular features? And of course, there are particular features in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe, because 40 years of a profound social transformation or social control obviously have their legacies. One legacy is that it's no longer on the lines of those who were with the communist regimes and those who weren't, because an irony of the transitions of the Velvet Revolutions is that it was members of the old communist ruling class, the nomenclatura, who often got rich quick. So they're now the beneficiaries of the transition. Ernest Gellner called this the price of velvet. And so the lines are drawn very differently. They're defending the sort of liberal, pro-European, globalized model against people like Yaroslav Kaczynski, who are bona fide solidarity activists in the 1980s. Peculiar features? First of all, everywhere it's about inequality. But for the reason I've just explained, in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe, it has the added edge of a sense of historical injustice. I've been to talk to former workers at the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk who are now unemployed, still very poor, living in a crappy two-bedroom apartment in a concrete tower block. And they can see that General Yaroslavsky's former spokesman, Yezhi Orban, is living the life of Riley in a great villa in Warsaw. So that, that edge of historical, a sense of historical injustice, uh, which we don't have in the same way in Britain or the United States, is, I think, one characteristic uh, feature of it and the way in which the past is instrumentalized by particularly the Polish populists, but also Viktor Orban, who say 1989 wasn't a proper revolution. It was just a deal between communists and ex-communists. The proper revolution is happening now. We're the first people who are building a proper non-communist state. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I thought when I was thinking, you know, the people who had the most lost the most and the people who had the least gained the most. And, and in neither case is that actually true, because in, in a lot of cases, the people who had the most still found a way to keep some of it. And the people who had the least somehow failed to benefit or, or weren't enabled to, to benefit from. And again, I mean, in, in northeast Germany, you know, it, it was very clear even immediately after the wall came down that people were people were angry and and they blamed foreigners and, and all the rest of it. And you still have sort of very low levels of representation in, in the German government and in, in cultural life of people from the East German lender, don't you? I mean, although it's been reintegrated or, or reunited for 30 years, it's not really united at, at, the, at the top of at the elite of the country. So, so first of all, because winners and losers from transition has become a bit of a cliche. One has to take that apart because, of course, in very important ways, everybody won. Unless you think political freedom, freedom of association, freedom of speech don't matter, everybody won. And also being members of the European Union, if you want to go and live in Britain or France or Germany and make your life there, you can do it. These are huge gains available to every single person. So, so one should be careful of being too sweeping. The East German case is fascinating because a, a lot of the argument about populism has been about economic versus cultural explanations. Now, in the East German case, because of the trillions of Deutschmarks and then Euros that were invested in East Germany, everybody's got much better off. They're paid less than people in the West, but they're a hell of a lot better off relative to what they were. But still you have this profound sense of grievance. And that shows you that there is a cultural dimension that is at least as important as the economic one. So, for example, in Saxony and Thuringia, you have opinion polls where a clear majority of people say they're much better off. They even say we're doing well economically. Most of the voters for the Alternative für Deutschland, AfD, the far-right populist party, say they're doing well economically, but they also say, I've been treated as a second-class citizen. And it is one of the weirdest things in recent European history to see, and I've seen it with my own eyes, what I might call neocolonialism in one country. That is to say, West German professors, 
or bosses who'd been parachuted into East German universities or enterprises, treating the locals with the condescension, if not contempt, that one might expect from a British district commissioner in India in 1920. Which is which is very sad, actually, and and it is to be hoped that they can find a way through that. One final question before I let you go. You've written that freedom's battle is never finally won. It must be fought anew in every generation. Why is democracy not enough? Or maybe that's not what you meant. So let me first of all tell you the background to the phrase freedom's battle, because it's quite interesting for your listeners, I think. At the very origins of Solidarność, a little sheet of paper was pinned to the wooden cross outside the shipyard with written on it some words from Byron in the famous translation by the romantic poet Adam Mickiewicz, for freedom's battle once begun, bequeathed by bleeding sire to son, though baffled oft, is ever won, except they'd omitted the word bleeding because this was meant to be a non-violent revolution. And that has accompanied me for the last 40 plus years, like a kind of light motif through my entire work. And I'm afraid the mistake we, we liberals in the broadest sense, pro-European liberals made sometime in the 2000s, was to sit back and think, oof, after it's been a long time, but freedom's battle has been won. And just at that moment, the forces of reaction started hitting us left, right, left, right, Putin's occupation of Crimea, the refugee crisis, uh, fueling nationalist populist parties, Brexit, Viktor Orban, law and justice in Poland, and so it goes on and on and on, and we're still reeling from it. So clearly, freedom's battle is never finally won. We sort of knew that, but half forgot it. And democracy in and of itself is not enough, it also needs the social, the economic, and the cultural dimensions of a liberal democracy. And these are the things that got neglected or forgotten. And once again, I stress the cultural dimension, because obviously what is in crude shorthand called neoliberalism has given us very high levels of economic inequality. But What's even more painful to many people is what I call the inequality of attention or the inequality of respect, the feeling that many, many people have in our societies, those who perhaps didn't go to university, don't live in big cities, don't enjoy the opportunities that Europe offers, that they're being not just disrespected, but simply ignored by liberal metropolitan elites, by people in universities like Oxford and Cambridge, dare I say. And they have a point. They absolutely have our point. And in a way, the populist vote and the Brexit vote is just saying, we're here, we exist, attention must be paid, we must be listened to. And indeed, they must. The Polish populists have a very curious phrase. They talk about the need for the redistribution of respect not just the redistribution of income, the redistribution of respect. And I think that's absolutely right. And part of the the reform and renaissance of liberalism, which is something I'm very much engaged on thinking about at the moment, has precisely to be in that area of the redistribution of respect, of paying attention to the other half of our societies of those who feel left behind by globalization and Europeanization and the digital revolution and all of that, and giving them back a sense of of worth. Uh, And in that sense, even though it comes from a government which I'm anything but admiring of, I think we do indeed need some levelling up. Professor Timothy Garden-Nash, thank you very much for spending this time with us. Um, That was tour de force uh, across our own history great great pleasure thank you for listening to this podcast from cambridge geopolitics conversations you can find the center for geopolitics on twitter at at cam geopolitics and all our events are advertised online on our website at cfg.polis.cam.ac.uk